Lee Kelly's work is always, for me, infused with a sense of Eros and Thanatos, the erotic presence of life and the Thanatos, the sorrow of loss. This guy looks like the Marlboro Man, and he's often dressed in jeans and a work shirt, but he doesn't smoke. He might have smoked maybe back in the day, for all I know. The first word I would say is he's human. He touches into who you are and makes you comfortable. Often a little twinkle in his eye. The Lee Kelly that you would meet in a social setting is someone who is modest and unassuming, uh, doesn't talk a lot, and in some ways lets his art speak for itself. Big, bold, strong. I'm pretty sure that it's very obvious to a lot of people that there's a lot of love, a lot of heart goes into this stuff. And it is an absolute joy to be here in the shop and just help out. You're going to have to pull a conversation out of Lee. Man, a few words. But once you build up a rapport with him, you'll have some interesting stories. Lee Kelly is the prototypic Westerner, born in Idaho, raised on a ranch. He's always been a, a inventor, a person who can th think on his feet and resolve a problem the way a, farm, a farmer does, fixing a bit of equipment. And so when you meet him, he has this outgoing, open, Western quality. I can remember making, trying to make a self-portrait I must have been six or seven, and I'm looking in the mirror, and it dawns on me that if a, an, it come to an edge of a plane, you've got to substitute a line for that edge. And I remember being really troubled as a six-year-old about how to substitute a line for this change of these planes. Lee was trained as a painter. You know, he, like many artists in his generation, if they were interested in their time and the present, they embraced abstract expressionism. His first show at the museum in the early 60s were, were these organically inspired, growing forms. One uh, plane becomes a volume, becomes a curve, defines a structure, becomes a thing. I was working in San Francisco in 71 for John Bowles, the architect there. Lee was, had won a competition to design uh, the F gate at Candlestick Park and uh, came up uh, to do the installation and I got to know Lee in that time and had and expressed some dissatisfaction with architecture. I was young and wasn't sure that was what I wanted to do and he said, well, why don't you come work with me? And, uh, and I was looking for a change, and so I did. I, I shut everything down down there and drove up and moved in, onto their farm. When I first came to Portland in the mid-70s from LA, where I was working in New York, we visited the Rose Garden, and I saw his sculpture there that he'd done in the 70s, and I said, I could live in Portland. There's a real artist that lives here. I often see pieces become more intimate over time. Like the Rose Garden piece is a good example of that. So I love to watch people use it. And it is intimate. They have it, people have, any time that people have a, an ongoing relationship with the work, the work responds to that, and you can see it. The fountain piece on the transit mall, which is one of the great public pieces in America. It was a piece that was done early in the 70s. And it creates a sense not only of the city around it, the volumes, the corners, the light and shadow of a cityscape, of the built environment, but it evokes the waterfalls of the Columbia Gorge, the kind of solid and transparent relationship that water moving over stone falling has in our mind. So it is like the buildings that surround it, open and closed, light and shadow, mass and vista. And I think for me that is the essence of what Lee could do in his 
and does in his public commissions is create a sense of place that is complex, engaging visually, audibly, emotionally in a way that few sculptors do. Lee's brother died of tetanus. His name was um, Jimmy Kelly. I didn't know him because he died when he was 10 years old. I was 13 and, and I didn't know how to handle that. Didn't get any help. My mother, Jeanette Bernhardt, she died in 1960, about six months after I was born, and she had a, a blood disease. And it came on very suddenly, but she, and, and she was just gone. And then my brother, Jason, uh, it was not till 1978, he was, he was 15. Um, that was leukemia, and that had a long course but so many of the things that have happened in the family have been uh, tragic and instantaneous. And uh, Bonnie, my stepmother, is a good example. She died in a, um, a climbing accident, and it was sudden and instantaneous and changed everything. That year she died, I just um, couldn't really get focused on doing anything but trying to deal with the, the grieving process. So. These four pieces came out of that next year. His personality is not to talk a lot or openly about these things. He is a person, I think, in, in nature to just let his actions speak for himself. And I just about lost it that winter. Cassandra, in her wisdom, called Susan Hanner and said, you know, come look after the boy. And so that was basically when Susan and I really got together. In the last 26 years, we've traveled to every country in Southeast Asia. We've traveled in um, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, South America, Central America, uh, a little in Europe, but he's not very interested in Europe. Last night in half sleep, I touched your breast. Now in an airplane half a world away, I remember exactly the meaning of love. Leland Ironworks is a magical place. When Lee and Bonnie Bronson, his second wife, moved on to that property, it was an open field with a three-story dairy barn. They planted every tree. And as the trees grew, the work tumbled out and onto the property. And it's green and leafy and vibrant. And there's all this sort of natural energy, but also the energy from the sculptures that are just sort of residing there. It's like a museum just set in the outdoors. I'm doing a series of pieces related to the, my years in Nepal, the trekking and the bronze casting and, and getting to know the people. And so this is kind of a tribute to them. There is a tremendous amount of thought process that goes on in the work before we get to the table here, before we get to the drawing or the design or ordering the steel, um, there's a lot more going into that, a lot more uh, thought, heart, and emotion into it than um, you know, what we do here. Well, Akbar was a uh, Mughal emperor in India, and he uh, was very interested in all the cultures of India, and he took, he got a wife from each one. And this thing deals with the idea that if he was moving from Agra to Delhi, how many elephants would it take to carry his girlfriends and his luggage? And I came up to, thought it was in the 90s somewhere. I was hung up on elephants for a while. This piece had to do with a trip that touched on northern Brazil. And we were going down a road in these great bunch of sulfur butterflies flew up out of the middle of the road. There's a beautiful piece called East of Riggins that where the trees have grown up through it and around it and 
it is perfectly integrated into the environment. In some ways, I think when we did this place, I was attempting to recreate that ranch on the Salmon River. In 1986, I actually got a, a commission for him to do a large-scale sculpture, the arch at Cornell Oaks. And it was a very successful project, and that launched our working relationship. They were gonna put up a, a sign to indicate the real estate development, and somebody said, well, let's get an idea about a sculpture and, and we can balance the two. We came in in 20 grand under what the sign would have cost. <laughs> That was the first public sculpture in the city of Richmond that wasn't a Confederate general or on a horse. So there's that Monument Avenue. Every block there's a turnaround with a, a horse and a general. And the, boy, the people, the press were really ugly about that, calling me a carpet beggar and all kinds of stuff. Another piece that's more, more recent is one that he um, did in the lobby of the Vestas. I love that piece. It's so lyrical how it moves on that wall, but it takes command of that wall too. I really like um, uh, Lewitt, the piece at uh, Salmon Creek Legacy, the big orange piece in front of the uh, Legacy Hospital. I think that is so beautiful, it's so strong and uh, so bold. Now, it was once a park, but now it's a parking lot. And the idea was to put one of Lee's great works here ahead of a planning process to reclaim this as a public space and then to continue the North Park blocks uh, through the River District, through the old post office site. The scale of that, the personal aspect of that, you know, the material, it's Corten steel, and I, and I think the personal biography in that work, to me, that, that's my favorite public artwork. Initially, there's a lot of doubt, self-doubt, even though you've had it, think you've nailed it, and it's installed, and then you look at it, and then you, you waver. But then a few years later, you see it again, and you think, no, oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> and I hear architects say that, too. That there's this moment of self-doubt, and then eventually, it'll come around again to being just about right. He is an Oregon treasure. Uh, we're just proud that he is in our midst, and we are, as a city, especially proud that Memory 99 is here in the North Park Blocks.
Well, about five years ago, um, I was uh, looking at the King Tut exhibit at the Seattle Center, and I came out of this dark room with all these pieces of art, and there was a pop machine and a garbage can, and there was this kind of mistreated uh, sculpture propped right between the two. They'd had it for over 50 years, and they charged him to ship it back here. <laughs> and he uh, painted it blue and it is so wonderful. So then decided that it needed to be here and needed to be uh, around the paintings that were done during the same era. Lee clearly is one of the most significant Northwest sculptors of the last uh, really, you know, generation, two generations. But I think maybe a more apt characterization is that that he is just a damn beautiful sculptor. I'm very interested in this sort of ambient layer that goes over all of us where we all take inspiration from and grow from it and learn from it and contribute to it. He has continuously looked to the future not the past to his present not his loss. It is the strength of his being, and ultimately it is the power of his sculpture to excite, to generate, to open the door to imagine. And that is the gift of Lee Kelly's sculpture. He stands today as resilient and embracing of life as that 13-year-old boy on a farm in Idaho.